I'm certainly a cannabinoid fan, probably more well known for my interest in terpenes. Um, I think, you know, fully, wholeheartedly embracing the entourage and ensemble effects. I think all of them are important. More of them together are probably more efficacious than one by itself. Um, but today I'm gonna to talk a little bit more about what we're seeing in the cannabinoid space, uh, predominantly in the hemp-derived cannabinoid space. And as we know, there are many different cannabinoids, certainly won't try and cover all of them. Um, and there's the major actors and some of the uh, you know, more emerging ones like Ethan was just highlighting. Um, and some of the more common minor ones, like he had mentioned, CBG, CBGA, CBN, and THCV. But what we're starting to see in the marketplace, uh, which I will highlight is a highly unregulated marketplace, I will definitely echo Ethan's frustrations and concerns with legislators, lawmakers, and regulators. Um, science moves at a much more rapid pace than any of them seem to be able to do so. Um, despite our yelling at them, screaming at them, trying to converse with them, and really adamantly talking to them um, just time and time again about problems that we may see coming as science and technology advances much more rapidly than the law and regulation. And what we're seeing today are more of these hemp-derived cannabinoids. So the 2018 Farm Bill put the lovely word derivative um, in the language, and as a chemist, we all <laughs> started to light up saying, how might we derivatize some of these molecules? Um, what might this open or entail? And what we're seeing today are some of the ones listed on the bottom of the slide. Um, I'll try to not have to pronounce every single one of them, <laughs> um, but there certainly is a large plethora of them, um, and the lettering and the numbering and naming start to get rather dizzying, even for a chemist such as myself. So I can appreciate you know, the lawmaker and regulator position when they say, I don't understand chemistry. I failed math and science in, in high school and didn't even take much of it in college. So what am I supposed to do about trying to write legislation or regulation around these things? We try to comfort them and say, here's some copy-paste language. It sometimes goes over well, sometimes does not. Um, but they hear from everyone in the industry. And unfortunately, there are some folks with very strong lobbying efforts, very large amounts of financial resources that can keep getting the conversations time and time again. And they are saying, there's no problems, don't worry, everything's fine, um, please let things persist as is. And I think in the absence of regulation, we have seen that in the cannabis industry, we know that there are purity problems, there are mislabeling problems, there are all sorts of issues that arise that are not to the benefit of a consumer and especially not to the benefit of patients. So we can't continue to operate in a, a space with no laws that are clear and no regulations that are really helping to define how these products should be produced and managed uh, and introduced to the public. Um, so there are, you know, a small problem here as a chemist, there was an old numbering system, um, and this shows the numbering systems. I'll just highlight the, the three and the four, um, because the numbering system around the ring changes um, into what we see today. So this is the more modern numbering system based on some technical chemistry positions. Um, and we're familiar with what's up here is shown as delta-9 THC. And so you'll see around the ring structure here, um, there are many isomers. This is where you get delta-8 when you go and move the double bond from 9 to 10 to 8 to 9. Um, there are many other derivatives. You can pretty much walk that double bond all the way around the ring and see one of those is probably out there in some fashion. Some of them are more thermodynamically favorable to form or produce than others. So some might be much more easily accessible than others. Um, certain derivatives are probably more plentiful because of that. Um, that's just the physical nature of chemistry. We are also seeing derivatization on the phenolic OH um, by acetylation. So forming acetates, um, things like that. So we have that as another functional point in the molecule that we can see derivatization. And the other aspects of some of these compounds that are out here are aliphatic chain lengths. So you just heard about THCV. That's when the chain length is shorter. Um, there are also some other ones out there in the marketplace now where the chain length is longer. And I'm going to try and describe uh, a little bit of each of these. So when you look around the ring up here, um, you'll see the isomers such as delta-8, 
uh, delta 10, delta 7, delta 11, and this is where it's the little funny part, um, delta 3 or delta 4, which would be the 10A or 6A positions. And the number is where the double bond starts, um, just uh, for the nomenclature. So you can make delta 8 THC from delta 9 THC. You can also make pretty much any of these from CBD. So hemp farmers overproduced. There was a lot more hype and interest in cultivating CBD. It is very easy to manufacture and isolate CBD isolate in high purity. So CBD is a solid. That's very friendly from a manufacturing standpoint to isolate with high purities. I can recrystallize it. I can get it to come out and filter it. THC, delta-9 THC by itself, is a highly viscous, sticky oil. So I don't have the ability to recrystallize it or make it a high purity solid. I'm trying to distill it, and often there are a few other either minor cannabinoids or other components that go with it. You can see you know, typical THC purities in the marketplace um, in the 90s, 85 to 90%, sometimes a little over 90%, but you can't see the same purity as you can with CBD. So I can get CBD at 99 plus percent. Um, it's readily available. It's extremely cost effective as a chemical synthon. So now that that's out there, the current estimates that we're hearing are about 75% of the CBD in the marketplace is being derivatized to delta-8 or even delta-9 THC. Depending upon how you try and control the chemistry, you can get the cyclization to happen and you can land at delta-9 or delta-8 THC. So poor farmers had to get rid of their compounds in some fashion, they had overproduced, and we see this rise in delta-8 THC types of products. I don't think it's the molecules sometimes that we should think, you know, could be demonized. I think delta-9, obviously, we know much about. Delta-8, I think, has wonderful physiological properties. I think there's great potential for that. It's uh, a little bit akin to a hybrid between delta-9 THC and CBD. Um, slightly lower psychoactivity potentials. It could be very beneficial for some. And some folks are saying it's their medicine of choice. Um, so I think we know a little bit more about that one than some of these other derivatives from medicinal chemistry studies or other types of, you know, pharmacophoric perspectives that the pharmaceutical industry has performed over many years. It's not quite as studied as Delta-9, but I'm a little bit more of a fan of Delta-8 than some of the other derivatives because we know a little bit more about it today. The question becomes, what have I used to make it and what might be left with it? So what's the end purity of the product? And are there any other you know, cannabinoid or cannabinoid-like impurities? Or are there any of the reagents that were used in this type of transformation that might be present as well? Um, and it was funny to kind of look back from my perspective. Um, at UCLA in 2018 in um, CanMed, I presented this exact slide. It was the last slide in my slide set. And we talked about Delta-8. Um, we penned a white paper on Delta-8 THC in 2018 when we saw the, the Farm Bill language. We knew that this might be coming. Um, I didn't quite expect it would be coming as much as I've seen today. Um, but, you know, our concern then was what you see here. What else is going with it? So I'll call it a Delta-8 product, or someone will call it a Delta-8 product, but what else was there? And what we saw in a one sample in Oregon is highlighted in orange, where you've got other things that are obviously cannabinoid-like molecules. Um, a much better representation is the blue line, where you have a little bit of CBN, and I'll, I'll caution, this is um, diode array detection. CBN lights up a lot greater than the other cannabinoids uh, because of the wavelength that you're using when you do detection. So it's not a quantitative picture. Um, but the unknowns are obviously much more present in the orange sample than in the blue one. And this was the concern. What else is going with it? What else was made in the manufacturing process? Um, today in Oregon, the regulator has tried to stop the introduction of Delta-8 and other synthetic cannabinoids in their regulated supply chain. They had found most Delta-8 on their marketplace was between 70 to 85 percent impurity. And it just begs the question, what's the other 15 to 30 percent? Is it an unknown cannabinoid? Is it some other impurity? Is it something that could be highly toxic? Is it something that may even be better for us? Simply because we don't know, we really shouldn't permit those in the marketplace or in the product streams. They've tried to set up a system where we might be able to introduce um, regulators approving a process. I think that's more of a sensible approach, 
if this molecule seems to be okay and we're okay with that being in the marketplace, then how has it been made and how do we monitor that process and know the impurities that go with it? And that's a major reason the FDA exists. So in the absence of federal regulations doing these types of things, which they do for pharmaceutical APIs and, you know, all the time, we're going to require state regulators to try and grapple with this problem or send folks into the field to um, identify processes. Now, Oregon has said if you've got a new dietary ingredient process, if you've got a molecule under grass status or self-affirmed grass, then you might be able to say that process has been approved in a federal sense and that would be acceptable to introduce into the Oregon regulated supply stream. They specifically carved out CBN as well um, for some other reasons, but there was a lot of CBN already in the marketplace and they think that that one might have been a little bit more acceptable. Um, as a synthetic chemist, I don't know if that's necessarily true, the manufacturing methods to CBN, um, depending how you try and get there, could actually create a large number of impurities. So these are kind of the two that I'm maybe a little more worried about. Um, there's some others I'm much more worried about. But the HHC, the fully hydrogenated version where there's no um, double bonds left, and CBN. So these come from delta-8 or delta-9 and hydrogenation. To perform hydrogenation, and, and quickly, my background is a synthetic chemist, so I'm pretty well versed in these manufacturing methods. I performed hydrogenation methods myself um, in graduate school. You require a catalyst. It's typically palladium or platinum. Sometimes it can be some other exotic metals that are used. Um, but those are really concerning as to what levels of those are being left in the products. No cannabis testing lab that I am aware of is testing for a trace palladium, platinum, or any you know, catalytic um, reagents that may be used in a hydrogenation process. So um, the FDA very tightly scrutinizes hydrogenation methods. Um, it's a very common last step in a lot of APIs. It is something that can be managed and is watched, but you have to be very careful that your palladium catalyst is not stuck to your product. It's not leaching into your end product. And no one here that I am aware of is currently watching that today. That's of great concern. So understanding the process and how we get there, what of those reagents might be left in the product is really uh, of great concern. I put the asterisks up there because hydrogenation happens from the top or the bottom of the molecule and you'll create a chiral center here. So you'll have a right hand, left hand type of problem. You definitely have different physiological activities. Sometimes you can have um, catastrophic types of physiological activities such as the case of thalidomide. So understanding your enantiomers may be very important as well. Um, when you leave the double bond in delta-9 and delta-8, you don't have that racemate problem. When it starts walking around the ring, you start to generate the problem as well. So now we have complex mixtures of problems. We're going to need much more advanced analytical methodologies to discern what is this mixture over that mixture. Some of them may have better medical efficacy than others. Some of them may generate unwanted toxicities. We really don't know, and I think it's really more incumbent upon us to say, let's slow the train down a little bit and start to understand, at least from a toxicological perspective, what are we introducing into this grand human experiment that we're running. Um, the, you know, the scientific train and manufacturing abilities are greatly ahead of legislation and regulation. This is the structure of CBN. Um, I think we're probably far less concerned about its physiological activity because it doesn't cause potential psychoactivities. Um, I think it's you know, potentially okay from a metabolic standpoint. I worry about HHC's metabolic abilities. So most of the metabolisms are allylic oxidations. You need the double bond present to facilitate oxidation and then eventual clearance from the body. I'm not aware of the metabolic fates of HHC. I don't know if they've been fully studied. And it starts to, you know, make you question, will this build up to toxic levels in the body? Might it become a problem if I chronically use it over time? Certainly at larger and larger doses, how much of an issue might it be? We're aware of, you know, complications with CBD and liver potential toxicities. We're aware cannabinoids have to go through the cytochromes to, you know, be metabolized and excreted. What happens to ones that really may potentially lock that system up or be, you know, very problematic? I think those are still somewhat unknown questions as well. Um, the acetates, I'm also not a significant fan of. We have some um, big problems with that in a couple of different ways. 
And I apologize, it shouldn't be acetylized. I think the industry and my toddlers keeping me up too late at night got into me. It's acetylate. <laughs> um, acetylized is not a word, so I apologize for the error on the slide. This is a simple chemical transformation. I just have to take the phenol, boil it in acetic anhydride, and I can make an acetate. Um, there are probably even other acetates that I might be able to make, and that starts to beg the question, how many of those might be okay or not? It's akin to the manufacturing method of taking morphine to heroin. So we know that there are huge differences in that. They now cross the blood-brain barrier in very different ways, and there are great concerns about these types of things being in, you know, in the body. I think the bigger problem with this is we now know phenolic acetates such as vitamin E acetate cause the cases of Evali. So when you heat these up to certain temperatures, they'll degrade into a molecule called ketene, which is highly reactive, and that caused significant lung um, you know, abrasions and problems. So these products inside of an inhalation product could be catastrophic. Um, I'm not a fan of allowing any of these. I don't think they're not naturally occurring. They're not found in the cannabis plant. They really don't make much sense. They're completely new molecular entities. Probably ha don't have great place inside um, of our regulated supply stream right now. We have plenty of other good cannabinoids to deal with that we're not tapping into. Let's stick to the natural ones. The aliphatic variants, the reason these are starting to show up is because they improve their potency at CB1. Um, and they start to become much, much more psychoactive and at least are touted as being 30 times stronger than THC itself for THCP. Um, so as you get longer in the chain, you can start to see that increase. There is a length limit. It starts to decrease as well. Um, but this is why you'll start to see six, seven, and eight carbon lengths uh, greater than the THC one that has five. Doing some of the math, if you have some of these present at 0.1% in hemp, it might take you $10,000 worth of raw material to produce a kilo of extract. And that's before you go about doing the manufacturing methods or isolations to go ahead and bring these products to market. So when they're selling for eight, nine, ten thousand dollars $10,000 a kilo, doesn't make me think that they're being derived from hemp. I'm not aware of any hemp cultivars that are actually present with um, you know, appreciable amounts of these molecules either. So while they may have been found in trace amounts, we have not used them in larger amounts. We're not putting 80% of those in concentrates. We're starting to venture into a realm where these are not really understood or well known. And again, I believe these are probably more than likely being synthetically derived and not being extracted from hemp, although all the web pages will tell you differently. So what do you see in the marketplace today? It's frightening. If you just start putting in, you know, THCH, THCJD, THCO, like just start looking up some of these websites and you'll see some of these products are throwing everything and anything in between um, to try and say my product's more potent, my product's differentiated, and you can buy them online. There's no age gating systems or, or kind of, they're hoping you have a credit card. Um, there is fancy packaging, things that may be attractive to children. And it's starting to blow back on the rest of the industry. So the poor licensed operators that have been operating within the states, desperately trying to follow hundreds of pages of regulations and complex laws, are being you know, forced to combat folks that don't pay the same taxes, don't have the same regulatory scrutiny, can't lose their license, and don't even have to care what's on their packaging. Um, I think that's exceptionally unfair. It's not rewarding to those that have been carving this difficult path for patients and other consumers. And to see products like this available at what could be a gas station or a grocery store or anywhere, you know, I mentioned I have toddlers, I have, you know, kids around me all the time. It is of grave concern to me and to many others like myself. What are these things? Why are they available? And why can't we do something to stop it? Um, so how do we regulate it? I don't know. This is like a good shot at maybe a, a good guess <laughs> to start with. Um, you know, Delta 9 THC, which we know is ranked as number six. You can't compare directly um, KI values or inhibitory constant values at CB1 because they're not always done in the same models. They're not always done in all these molecules. So I tried to take that, and with some help from ChatGPT, who doesn't know science very well either, um, you know, I just kept trying to think it through, think it through, and think it through, and came up with, you know, somewhat of a picture from a lot of anecdotal insights, a lot of what folks will tell you or post online, and some of what we know from general pharmacophoric structures, and some of what we understand from actual use within the cannabis industry. 
So this is a guess. This is not etched in stone. It's supposed to start conversation. And I think this is what the regulators may need to say, how do we start somewhere? So we can't say no to all of them. We definitely want some of them. Naturally occurring ones, that seems okay unless they seem to be too potent or not actually being isolated from the plant. Um, the approve column is saying the regulator should approve the process because the molecule might be okay, but how did you get there is a more concern. Um, and I really think that there's a lot to be had in a complex slide like this, a lot of questions that are you know, arising, but lawmakers and regulators, especially in California today, are trying to figure out how do I grapple with this problem? What should I allow or not allow? And I'm sure the federal regulators and lawmakers are thinking about it with rewriting the farm bill this year as well. Um, this again is not etched in stone, it's for conversation. There are some question marks here. Um, some of those are naturally occurring. I think the cannabinoid acids don't have the potency problem, but if you say all cannabinoid acids are allowed, we'll start to make the acids and then they'll decarboxylate them at home in inhalation devices and you might have the same problem. So it's a very sticky, wicked, and challenging problem um, with a lot of molecular and technical complexities, but it's one I think that is present upon us today and one that we have to take upon ourselves to really work together and say how can we best regulate these to allow the molecules that are beneficial to patients, good for consumers, but at the right purity and potencies and labeled properly so that we aren't harming anybody inadvertently because when they see they're tested, they think they're tested for everything. And we just have to be conscious of that. Thank you for your time. Sure, I, yeah, I'll take a question for sure. Uh, thank you, what a wonderful talk. And so eye-opening as a clinician, I, you know, I know when the Avali thing happened, it was like, we're not testing for the vitamin E acetate, so we didn't know, but I'm curious, do you think there's going to be any work this year with the farm bill since it, we're coming up on the five-year anniversary? Do you think some, you know, because what I'm seeing now is in the hemp marketplace, THC at five to 10 milligrams of hemp-derived THC, which in some ways as a clinician, I appreciate because it's easily accessible for patients, you know, in, in states that don't have it. But, you know, then I see this talk and I'm, you know, scared. So do you think there's any any talks right now about the hemp bill? Do you have any insights around that and changes? Thank you. Yeah, there are a lot of to folks talking about the farm bill. I think there's an effort towards aiming to regulate um, THC amounts. So the farm bill says 0.3 weight percent THC. That was meant for biomass, not for manufactured products. Because if I make, you know, a granola bar or a brownie or a chocolate bar, and I say it's 0.3 weight percent THC, I can have potencies and products that are much stronger than what's allowed in the regulated market. It's just a simple math game. I'll just make the product bigger, and all of a sudden I've got 30 or 300 milligrams in one unit. I don't want anyone getting that at a gas station. That's ridiculous. And that was not the intent, I think, of the law. They just didn't know what they were writing. And in the absence of regulations, everybody points to 0.3 weight percent, which is why they think there's some legal precedent to allow them um, to have those products. The DEA is like, we don't think that was the case. We've kind of, they've kind of said, you know, HHS has said, hey, you guys need to regulate this or take some sort of look at it. So I think everyone's aware of the problem and they hopefully will come out with a total milligram allowance in hemp regulated products. Something that you can analytically test for, something that you could monitor and label properly and something that doesn't hurt all the legal state operators on the Delta 9 THC side. I hope. I, I can't promise. And you won't know until like the last second when someone finally says, okay, the bill's going to pass. Sure. Uh, hi. Uh, from one organic chemist to the other, um, how do they make uh, THCP and the other aliphatic chain length derivatives? Because so that's like quite hard. done with a levitolic acid and um, you just stick it together. So take a levitol, but it's a derivative of a levitol. It has the longer chain, and then you just stick it to the duranol group. Okay, so you just resource and all uh, stop yeah. material. Okay. Yep, so it's a simple synthetic process. It's not too complicated. But no derivatization of CBDs, but fully synthetic. Correct. Okay. Thank you, Jeff. Um, can you hear me? Sure. Um, Thank you, and always thank you for answering my many texts and emails and <laughs> learning from you. Always. Um, so my question is um, about what you think, and I don't mean to put you on the spot, but there were two cases that were published in the literature in December 22 of a 20-year-old and I think a 35-year-old that uh, were both uh, in separate cases but presented to the same hospital 
with psychosis, suicidal ideation, and what they called refractory depression after using Delta-8 products, and I believe it was in Colorado. My question to you is, do we have any idea which compound in this mix might be causing those, or is it more than one compound? I don't think it's the Delta-8. I'm with you in that. I don't think it's the Delta-8 itself. I mean, it may be, right? We can't rule that out, but I can't find analytical data on the products that they've had. They don't allow anyone to really scrutinize that for every other minor cannabinoid or impurity that's there. But it does beg the question, was it the impurities or something else in those manufacturing processes that caused that? Um, you know, much like spice and K2, we know if you lock up the endocannabinoid system, you can have huge problems. I think that's the concern with THCP and some of the other ones. When they're so strongly binding, you can lock the system up and have catastrophic issues. Are some of these metabol are some of these synthetic impurities causing the same problem? They're cannabinoid-like, so they could do so, but in the absence of great analytical understanding of those products, and I, I mean, I kind of doubt those were the only two people to take that product. So uh, you know, you're seeing probably out of a population, there's you know never 100% you know perfection in some of those. But it does beg the question, it's most likely not Delta-8, it's probably one of the other synthetic impurities on how they got there. But we don't know. Maybe time for one more. Sure. Um, are the cannabinoids hemp-derived and marijuana-derived the same? It's all cannabis to me. <laughs> Sorry, as a scientist, right, it's cannabis sativa L. We call it hemp or marijuana for legal and tax definitions. Okay. Um, so, uh, you know, which is horrific from a scientific standpoint and probably to everyone in this room. Um, hemp derived is saying I came from a cultivar that was high in CBD and low in THC. Marijuana would be one that has higher than 0.3 weight percent THC. It may also have some CBD and other ones. As a chemist, all the molecules are here. It may be more advantageous to go from one that is higher in one cannabinoid and expressed in a large amount. So if I have 20% CBD, isolating that CBD is much easier from that. But legally, I'm trying to call it hemp derived so I can skirt the state laws and I can just go out there and sell it online. So when you take it from a chemist point of view to a business point of view, it's an economic factor. Yeah, oh yeah, it's a huge economic piece, yeah. Jeffrey? Could I get one more? Uh, sure. Hey, um, I'm going to be meeting in Sacramento with some of the uh, state legislators for uh, Have fun. bills. We, they've actually been really good. They're, they're I, I've had some very good conversations with them. I think some of them want to hear. Some of them are just like, I have no idea. Please help me. Um, others are like, I don't know. Um, it's, totally. a, it's a crapshoot. Uh, what I was going to ask was, like, what is your short and sweet uh, for when I meet them? Because we've usually got about like 15 minutes. Uh, and I'll visit several offices, but I get to talk to the chair people, uh, the committees that are seeing those bills through. Try to listen to the diverse array of industry, not just one industry group. See if they are coalesced around a topic. Um, protect those that have state licenses because they've been working so hard to do so. And the question is, should we allow hemp ingredients into California's regulated supply stream? That's where they're being tested and labeled. That's where the rules apply. I think pushing everything into a cannabinoid centers of excellence, what we might eventually call these dispensaries, um, makes more sense because people should be more informed about cannabinoid, cannabinoid therapies, and that's where I'm kind of going to expect I'll have these things, and I wouldn't find something, you know, at a smoke shop or a gas station with someone that just said, go buy it because it's supposed to be the strongest thing out here. Uh, I think putting it in a dispensary makes much, much more sense just from a, a sociological standpoint. Good. Yeah, that's what they were looking at. Uh, thank you. You're welcome. Thank you, everyone.